just caught me. Reading up a little bit of our history, Trinity Christian Tabernacle, all about our pastors. Back in 2007, they were in the newspaper talking about their call. But we have celebrated Black Christian Month for over 21 years, and we're doing it again in the midst of COVID. 21 years of Black history through the eyes of our Trinity Christian Tabernacle family. This year, even though it's going to be different, we're still going to do it. We're going to have the did you knows, and we're going to have all the facts and history. And it's going to be interactive, because I know you guys like to be a part of everything. So sit back and enjoy this year's Black History Celebration. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you all felt welcome. And now, we cannot have a service without invoking the presence of the Holy Spirit in God. So we'll have prayer now by Reverend Everton Anderson. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. God bless you. Let us pray. Precious Holy Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment that we can come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom you give us access. We are here, Lord God, to present Black History Night, an event from where we came from, where you brought us from unto this very moment. Had it not been for you, we would not be able to see the history of the things that you have allowed us to come through. So we ask that you would just open up the mind and the order of your people as they enjoy the service. Bless everything tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Tonight, Black History Celebration is all about black excellence. And we know that we have a rich history, and we're going to see that tonight. But right now, you guys who have been with us over the last 21 years know that we always open up with Lift Every Voice, the Black Anthem. So here with a video and singing Lift Every Voice is the great Alicia Keys. Enjoy. We go to Arrowhead now for Lift Every Voice and Sing as it's played in the state. At the dawn of the 20th century, the 20th century America was a country America full of country promise and hope for many. Hope for many. Black America was a country full of promise and hope for many. Black Americans faced a different reality, a nation separate and unequal. Yet their hope persisted. Pained by inequality, but inspired by resilience, writer and civil rights activist James Weldon Johnson put pen to paper. His words would become a unifying call, a hope for a brighter tomorrow, a timeless exhortation to lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmony Of liberty Let our rejoice Facing our eyes in sun of 
hardships that we strive for excellence. Let's take a look at where we have come from to where we are now. we were able to find our excellence. We strive to do better and to grow, even in the face of Jim Crow. With my face turned to the side. Weight on my shoulders, a bullet in Oh, I got eyes in the back of my head. And through these hardships, it was our faith in God that helped us. I do what I can, what I can, what I can for my people. While the clouds roll back and the stars fill the night, that's when I'm gonna stand up, take my people away. We have iconic authors and writers and poets. Here is a poem by the great James Baldwin by the even greater poet, Maya Angela. I had certainly seen him before that particular afternoon, but he'd been just another cop. After that afternoon, he had red hair and blue eyes. He was somewhere in his 30s. He He walked away John Wayne. Black iconic poets, authors, writers, trailblazers with their pen. Here's a list of some, and I encourage you to look these guys up, read them, learn. Zora Nell Hertzen, Langston Hughes, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Pauline E. Hopkins, James Walden Johnson and his brother, Rudolph Fisher, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker. Now, here's a poem by Toni Morrison by Mahalia Anderson. This is precisely the time when artists go to work. 
You had no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilization heals. Written by Toni Morrison. Here we have a redemption of a poem by Blessed Anderson. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or does it fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Is it crust and sugar over like it's syrupy sweet? Maybe it's just sad, like a heavy load, but it doesn't explode. Let's go back in time to see how music has paved the way. Music that help us through the struggles and the hardship and strive for that excellence. <laughs>
I heard a robin this morning. I'm feeling happy today. I'm gonna put my cares in a whistle. Blow them all away. Too Short to Box with God were one of the plays that hit the scene in the 70s and 80s, and it was my first stage play. Here is Patti LaBelle talking about her experience when she starred, and your arms are too short to box with God. Patti LaBelle electrified her opening night audience tonight on Miami Beach. The scintillating star in Broadway's musical, Your Arms Too Short to Box with God. Conceived from the Book of St. Matthew by Vinette Carroll, it is a gospel show using song and dance to tell the story of Jesus Christ. Before her opening night performance, Patti LaBelle, the popular rhythm and blues singer, talked about an international theme she infuses into the production. No matter what color you are in the audience, you end up doing the same thing or what religion or whatever. It's just a melting pot of feelings and emotion and it never fails that everyone leaves here feeling the same and the message is uh, 
Jesus, if you love Jesus, and if you love humanity, and if you love, you will end up leaving here feeling wonderful and lifted. Play promoters say it's song and dance numbers like this one that draws standing room only crowds wherever the show is performed. It's time for some more Did You Knows. Susie King Taylor was born a slave in 1848 and was the first black teacher ever to teach to for other former slaves. This was in Savannah, Georgia. She died in 1912. Robert Louis Gilbert, guess who he was? He was the first black teacher to teach at an all white school. This was in Waco, Texas. Alexander Lucas Twilight was the first known African-American to graduate from a college in the United States. He received a bachelor's degree from Middlebury College in Vermont in 1823. Driving for our excellence. Oftentimes, it was the young people who took the forefront in our struggle. From Ruby Bridges to the Little Rock Nine, the college students of the lunch counters in North Carolina, they were the ones out in front, paving the way for our excellence. Okay, one more did you know. Samuel R. Laurie was an American preacher who was the first black lawyer to argue a case in the front of the Supreme Court of America in 1880. This is what I mean by striving for excellence. Black people have been striving for excellence ever since they brought us over here from Africa. Let's take a moment to remember those who fought the good fight. Those who were on the forefront of the civil rights movement. Those who were on the forefront of making equality part of our history. We need to remember Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, Dr. King, Nelson Mandela, we need to remember those who helped us strive for excellence. We also need to remember Breonna Taylor, Marcus Brown, George Floyd, and so, so many more. How did we get to excellence? It's not just that we had the, the courage to keep fighting, but we kept calling on Jesus' name. Black excellence. You know that our hair has been a part of the struggle? Did you know our hair has been called a defense, an offense to people? Let's look back at a hundred years of our black hair. <laughs>
food, the soul food. You know, our culture has been defined by our food. You know, the fried chicken, the collard greens, black eyed peas, and sweet potato pie. But that is all wrapped up in our culture and our history. So let's take a look back. Kwaku woke up as the sun rose. His mother had prepared a breakfast of roasted yams, tomatoes, and onion. A couple centuries ago, European sailors had brought these plants from the Americas to West Africa. Western Europeans began arriving in West Africa as early as the 1400s. They enslaved West Africans to build their settlements. Because of the transatlantic slave trade between Europe, the Americas, and Africa, many different foods were exchanged between the continents. African foods such as okra, watermelon, and coffee were exported to the Americas. Corn, potatoes, and sugarcane from the Americas were brought to Africa. Europeans brought cows and the cultivation of cheeses and milk. Kwaku didn't know this would be the last day he would live in his native land. That night, European slave traders kidnapped Kwaku and his family from their beds. They were chained and kept in the hold of a slave ship en route for the United States. One hundred years later, Kwaku's great-great-grandson, Samuel, was born on a South Carolina plantation. Indeed, Samuel was far away from the bountiful gardens of West Africa. But Samuel and his family still grew West African foods like black eyed peas, greens, and okra. Samuel also grew watermelons in their tiny garden. The family had to work long hours in the hot fields with no break. It was easy to become sick from the heat. They found that eating pieces of watermelon would keep them from fainting and ultimately use this delicious food to survive. Plantation owners believed pork to be the healthiest kind of meat and they usually raised hogs for slaughter. Samuel learned how to cook with the leftover hog pieces like intestines and feet. His mother would use the leftover bones to flavor food. Samuel had a great great grandson named James, and James loved to cook. James could make fried chicken so well that friends and family would pay him to cook for their parties and holiday dinner. James learned how to fry chicken from his grandmother, who had learned from her mother, who had once been enslaved. During antebellum, white southern slave owners believed that chicken caused disease and sickness. Subsequently, James's great grandmother, who was enslaved at the time, was allowed to raise a few chickens. She passed along her fried chicken recipe to her children, and eventually James learned this recipe. James's chicken became so popular that he eventually opened his own restaurant. James loved listening to a new kind of music called soul music. He decided to call his new restaurant the Soul Shack. Fifty years later, James's grandson Amir sat in his university lecture hall. He couldn't wait for winter break. His stomach grumbled as he thought about the greens and sweet potato pie that his mother would cook. Amir was studying history. He wanted to be a professor. He often wondered about his own family history. During dinner, he asked his father, "Who was my great grandfather?" What was he like? Amir's father only knew that he had been enslaved on a South Carolina plantation many years ago. That night, Amir fell asleep, dreaming of a faraway place with deep green plants and trees, and of a people who were strong and brave. Thanks for watching Deeper Than Red.
You see, our soul food, our cooking is not just good. It's part of a rich history and tradition. Those yams and collard greens came over from Africa with us. It's a part of our culture and it's something that we need to continue. We need to continue to cook the food and tell the stories so that our children's children's children know our history. So they say soul food isn't healthy. We can still cook those greens, maybe leave out the pork. We can still fry the chicken, maybe use an air fryer. We can cook our history and still be healthy, but we cannot stop. Our culture must continue. Christian Tabernacle. God bless.